Today is the second Sunday of a series we're calling Easy Like Sunday Morning. It came to me on an old Lionel Richie song. Because it's easy, easy like Sunday morning. Yeah, you say, we just went from Chris's voice to your voice. Ouch. Young people are saying, I've never heard that song. That's because you kids don't know music. It raises a little bit of a question, though. Is it supposed to be easy? Is what we do, is it supposed to be easy? Is everything about Jesus designed to be easy? Has there been almost a, a dumbing down? And, and the next weird thought, if it's easy, is it pretty soon boring? A lot of Christians, I think, have grown bored and frustrated because they just believe in Jesus. But what if Jesus promises way something better than just believing? Because frankly, mere belief is nothing. Satan can and does believe. And yet Jesus comes along and says, I want something different from belief. Belief is an initial beginning, but that should give birth to following. So now these things kind of create questions. As Every answer creates a question, doesn't it? If I'm going to follow... How much is Jesus in my everyday life? And maybe the harder question, do I really want Jesus in my everyday life? Do I really want to follow to the point that he actually participates in my everyday life? I think Satan is pretty effective as people all across America are claiming Christianity, but they've discovered easy Jesus, easy like Sunday morning. I just, I just believe and when you just believe, his commandments almost become a little bit like suggestions. Take them or leave them. He's okay with that. If I believe, I can keep Jesus at a little bit of a safe distance. And when I keep Jesus at a safe distance, I can control him. Easy like Sunday morning Jesus, I can believe in Jesus and have my life not change in any way. I think many in Christians in America have that very relationship. I believe, but it hasn't affected my life much of any way. I've checked Jesus off the box. I'm not sure I can call that a relationship, whatever it is. I think we go back to the last month's series. Satan has not resulted to persecution in America because he has his, he has his goals met without needing to. He's filling churches with fragile Christians, hurt, church hopping, spiritual victims. They have fallen in love with easy like Sunday morning Jesus. And it's easy to get caught up at easy like Sunday morning Jesus. Because folks completely believe without any reservation that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again. He is on the right hand of the Father. That is powerful. That is true. And I think people here would say, I believe that with no reservations. I believe that with all my heart. I just never went beyond that. And I, and I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to downplay that. We, we praise God for that acknowledgement. But we got to consider, is acknowledging what I'm supposed to do? Is believing what I'm supposed to do? Is, am I called to something more? Yes. I participate in a church. I read the Bible now and then. I pray periodically. I put spiritual stuff on Facebook. Masses of people are calling themselves Christians that are not followers of Christ. They're a long way from it. Because they have fallen in love with easy like Sunday morning Jesus. What he wants of me is to buy in. What he wants of me is to believe. Okay, let's get down to hard truth. The truth is, we will never encounter real Jesus until we go beyond easy Jesus. Merely believing, now we actually go all the way to following. And I think our enemy, Satan, is really good at sleight of hand. He has a way of giving us a lot of options to follow, almost confusing us, keeping us away from the focus of Christ. He has a way of shining bright lights in our face. It's a story about a father was teaching his 15-year-old girl to drive, living in a small town, a lot of country roads, a place like us. Winter's tough. And he told her, someday you're going to be driving on a country road, and you're going to have a whiteout. I don't need to explain that to you. We've been there and done that. When the snow will come so fast to where you won't be able to see anything, don't panic. Pull over to the side of the road and sit. Put your flashers on. 
Tow trucks are really good about being there all the time. A tow truck will come down that road, and the tow trucks always work from the outside of the county into the city. If you just sit by the side of the road, a tow truck will come along. He'll have a great big light. Follow that light. It will take you right into town. Sure enough, not long after she learned this lesson from her father, it happened. She was in a country road. The whiteout happened. She could see nothing, and it popped what my dad said. Pull over, get off the road, put my flashers on, don't panic. And yes, he was right. Within 10, 15 minutes, here comes, here comes a tow truck, or a, 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 a snow plow, excuse me. And the snow plow is plowing the snow, leading right to town. She said, my dad was right. She got behind him, right behind him, and followed that light. And he began to make turns that she thought this was not the way to town. But my dad told me, I could become very disoriented, just trust that light. And he began to make more turns. Then he made sharp turns and she became almost afraid because she thought, this is not the way to town. I'm positive, but my dad told me I could become disoriented in the whiteout. But the turns were so sharp and so odd. Finally, the tow truck came to a complete stop. And she thought, this man has led me in the middle of nowhere. I'm defenseless. And sure enough, the man got out of the tow truck and he came back to her car. She thought, do I put it in reverse? Do I run, run where, what do I do? Panic set in. And sure enough, he tapped on the window of that car. She didn't know what to do. He yelled, I'm not going to hurt you. Open the window. And so she did. He said, I have finished plowing this parking lot. Are you going to follow me to the next one? <laughs> Understand this. The brightest light might not be the light you ought to follow. Satan is really good at sleight of hand. He's really good at putting, putting a light right in your face and saying, this should be followed. Satan's shiny light always ends up going in circles. He knows you were built with an instinct to follow Christ. It's in every one of us. An instinct that there's more. An instinct that there's more to my life. There's an instinct within us to follow Christ. So what he does is he provides a lot of other things to follow. He can't stop the instinct. So he tries to fill it with other things. And one of the things I think he tries to follow, get us to follow instead, is easy like Sunday morning Jesus. If you believe, you have fulfilled that instinct down in your heart. Because if Jesus is always at a distance, we control him. And we're never really understanding him controlling us. Frankly, it takes something of me to follow and nearly nothing of me to believe. It takes something of me to follow and nearly nothing of me to believe. And there are always life challenges in following Christ. It's not easy like Sunday morning. I love those great C.S. Lewis quotes. Let me read you a C.S. Lewis quote. I did not take religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port could make me happy. If you want a religion designed to always make you happy, I do not recommend Christianity. Wow. Gene, wait a second. What about the joy of the Lord? You preached a whole series a while back on the joy of the Lord. Are you backtracking? No. But real joy is only found in real victory, not cheap wins. Real joy is only found in real victory. That's following, not cheap wins. Following Jesus is that only route to which we have that satisfaction finally dealt with. Merely believing is why so many Christians are bored. And we look carefully at the New Testament. We can't escape the fact. When Jesus is encountering somebody, he's not challenging them to follow them. He meets these disciples. He's not challenging them to merely believe, excuse me. He's not challenging them to believe. He's always telling them, follow me. Let's get right into the word. Matthew 4, 19. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Luke 5, 10 and 11. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will follow me and you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on shore, left everything and began to follow him. It's a theme. As you look at his, his calling out to every one of those disciples, he never once says, what I want you to do is buy in. What I want you to do is believe. This is a sales pitch. He always says, follow. Nothing has changed. You cannot stop and believe. If you're going to stop and believe, then you got to be honest. You might as well be honest to yourself and admit, I am not a disciple. I am merely a believer. 
I have fallen in love with easy like Sunday morning Jesus. Gene, back off. Jesus said the same thing. John 12, 26, let's just keep, keep going in the word. Whoever serves me must follow me. And there was this guy who Jesus says, follow me. And the guy says, I need to bury my dad. I mean, this guy's going to his dad's funeral. Jesus doesn't let him. Matthew 8, 22. This guy's on his way to his dad's funeral. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Jesus told him, follow me. Let the, let the people who are dead bury their own dead. That's cruel. You mean to tell me this guy's on his way to his dad's funeral? And Jesus says, I'm not going to wait. I'm, I'm not going to delay for an hour so that you can go bury your dad. At first glance, we feel like, cry out loud. That's a little bit over the top. You can't go to your dad's funeral. The issue here, frankly, as you study that verse carefully, his dad's not dead. His dad may live 10 more years. His dad may be like me and go for another 30, 40 years. He said, let me continue with my father. Once my father dies, then sometime in the extended future. At that point, you can count on me. Well, Jesus tells him, no. Follow me. Nothing else is accepted. There's no easy belief here. There's no easy Jesus. From the very words of Jesus, on and on, this theme plays out. I want to keep you in the word. Matthew 9.9. 9. When Jesus was leaving, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. Jesus said to him, follow me. He stood up and followed Jesus. Matthew 10, 38. Whoever is not willing to carry the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoa. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his followers, how I, look how he defines them. If people want to follow me, they must give up the things they want. They must be willing to even give up their lives to follow me. It's a theme. He's not saying, you want to believe in me? Follow, follow, follow the words of, Je of Jesus. What happened to Easy like Sunday morning. There's not one invitation to believe. Now get ready for this. The invitation to believe is from Satan. He has no problem with you believing a thing. That's his invitation, not Jesus's. As long as it stops there. We're so fragile. A believer runs off the rails pretty quick. They're so bored in their Christian walk. Secondary issues that shouldn't matter to anything. Blow them out of the water. As a follower, it's hard to derail. It kind of takes us back to last week. People understand clearly what they're supposed to do. And they live in the what. They'll even do it. Because we know what a Christian is. We know what we're supposed to do. Followers know why. And they're in his purpose. And they're in his power. Purposely resolved from last week. Never live my life in the what again. Of course, of course. We need to believe to have faith. Don't, don't, don't hear more than I'm saying. I'm not knocking belief. Belief is the starting point for every single one of us. That's where I began. That's where you began. Every disciple, every follower started with belief. Don't, don't hear that that's a bad thing. It finally hit them. Jesus is real and I believe and I believe in him. At some point, that belief has got to blossom into faithfulness. If we're really going to be a follower of Christ. I'm so glad that you prayed a prayer of forgiveness that you brought Jesus into your life. You began a relationship. You began a journey with him. That's exciting. That's powerful. Celebrate that fact. Celebrate that fact. It's huge. Go from there. It does not stop us at the acceptance level. See, my, my wedding to Tammy was maybe the best day of my life. It was wonderful. It was exciting. But from that day on, I've been challenged to grow with her. She's part of my every life. She's proud of my every decision. She's my partner. She completes my life. No wonder Jesus comes along and says, okay, you get that? You're my bride. I will complete you. I am where life changes. In fact, he blows our mind. He says, I am where life begins. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am where life begins. He is to be part of our everyday life, literally our every decision. As a leader, we commit, I will follow my life. And that's not boring. That's not stagnant. That's not, you know, blah. Jesus provides growth and challenge. And going forward, if there's no growth in my life, in any arena of my life, eventually it is boring. Eventually it is stagnant. Eventually it is blah. 
Easy like Sunday morning is fine with no growth. Celebrate believing. Celebrate going nowhere in this journey. But I am a great believer. See, belief has an end game. I believe. You're done. Finished. You don't go from there. They're stagnant. Blah. Continuing, following, has no end game. It just continues on. We begin to develop this tenacity to actively follow him wherever he may lead, and that takes guts. Some have to say, do I have the courage to be a follower, or am I comfortable in the blah of belief? Do I have the courage to go forward? Do I have the courage to find out what my potential might really be? You are not going to discover your potential in mere belief. If I follow, he's going to lead me. He designed me. He knows me. He will lead me to my real potential. Do I have the courage to figure out and find out through Christ what my potential might actually be? You heard in the, in the announcement video. Yeah, here comes the commercial. This VNC Kingdom Experience. This is not really for people to put their toe in the water. This is nine months of getting into it, getting in the Word. I mean, getting in the Word, getting in the Word, having it really impact you. You want to sign up for this, buckle up. Because we want to be a part of this process with you. We want to design some things to encourage you, not motivate you, not push you, but encourage you and partner with you. Or let's just be content to coast. I love easy Jesus. I believe. And I make it to church periodically. But if he daily participates... We begin to even make small decisions following him, which gives birth to larger decisions and builds down the life and roots. Paul totally got this. Colossians 2, 7. Look how he put it. Let your roots go down into Jesus. Let your lives be built on him. And that's following. Then, yeah, then your faith will grow strong in truth. We were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. There's almost an if-then period going on here. As you grow deeper, then the power comes. As our roots grow deep, then we have strength. Then we have stability. Then we begin to understand maturity. Then we begin to understand blessings. We're not spending our lives as some kind of a spiritual victim. We're not swayed by the swaying changes of times. There begins a fierce determination, a tenacity. We're now actually winsome. We're noticed. Now we're a witness because somebody somewhere will begin to recognize how are you so grounded, so consistent in your life decisions because most people are not grounded. Your tenacity will stand out. Someone will be curious. Someone will want to know what you have. But if you're just a believer, tossed like every wind, no one wants to be like you. They already are. A life without the, the lost someone without Christ has no interest in the believer, but they're fascinated by the follower. Okay, game time. If you were to describe another person you know that is a dynamic Christian, if you could describe this dynamic follower in one word, what word comes to your mind? Okay, let's make it personal. Can that same word be used to describe you? I think one of the things that happens, and it happens to me, we want things spiritually. Our good intentions, we don't have to talk about. Our positive desires, that's not an issue. That, that's not a problem. I think we can all agree, I want my kids to be raised to where they have a true foundation, where they have real direction in their life. I want to exercise self-control. I'm not being drawn down to a destructive road. I want to control my temper and not be known as someone everybody's got to be careful around. I want others to see me as a true person of character. I want to always honor my spouse. As I walk through these, I think to a person, every single person, no exceptions, going, yeah, oh yeah, me too. We all agree these are things that we want. They're good and honorable. So what do we say about that? I come back and say, so what? What? Good intentions never give us the life we desire. Eugene Peterson put this so well. This is not a paragraph I want to read to you. I want you to see this thing. Look at what Eugene Peterson said about this. We don't become whole persons by merely wanting to become whole. 
by consulting the right prophets, by reading the right book, intentions must mature into commitment. If we are to become the persons with definition, with character, and with substance. You know the killer line there, don't you? At some point, intentions must mature into commitments. Good intentions probably get you behind the wheel of the car. They just don't drive the car. And you and I both know Satan loves good intentions. Is it not the oldest cliche in the world? The road to hell is paved with, say it, good intentions. Satan loves our good intentions. And good intentions, the problem, easy like Sunday morning Jesus kind of loves our good intentions. And another problem, good intentions do tend to create some good momentary feelings about who we are. Good intentions are a spiritual house of cards. Following is about commitment. Following is about tenacity. Following does not collapse like a house of cards. But Gene, wait, 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 wait. You are not counting grace. In this whole thing about the tenacity of following Jesus, you have completely ignored the issue of grace. Doesn't grace cover me? E even if my spiritual journey kind of stops at belief? Well, no. We begin to trade on grace. We begin to pretend grace is things it's not. Dallas Willard, in his great book, The Great Omission, puts it well. Grace is opposed to earning, but not opposed to spiritual effort. Grace reminds us we cannot earn our salvation. We can't. We cannot earn our place in Christ. It is a gift of the grace of God. It was paid for by a penalty we could not pay. Jesus on the cross. Jesus at the resurrection. At the cross, he defeats sin. The resurrection, he defeats death. Salvation is a pure, unadulterated, absolute gift. It is absolute grace. Grace is opposed to earning, but not spiritual effort. In fact, buckle up, grace makes demands. Yikes. Grace makes demands. Grace calls out the very best of us. Grace begins to reorient everything we thought we knew about life. So that now, grace begins to bless. Grace begins to comfort. Grace begins to be amazing. It spurs us on. That's why it's amazing grace. Grace doesn't let us settle for mediocrity. Grace doesn't let us settle for small living. It compels us to grow and change. Because it's tempting to think of God as such gracious that he is and loving that he will let everything slide. Never holding us accountable for our choices or never holding us accountable for not following through. We almost see God as this doting grandfather that not only misre misrepresents his mercy, it misrepresents his love. His love is way too relentless to let us stay where we are. I remember my my daughter, Julie, had this thought. She was going to run a mini triathlon. She'd be able to train for it. I know, we say mini, doesn't sound like much. Mini triathlon, you swim for a half a mile. When you get out of the water, you bike for 12.4 miles. When you get off the bike, you run for 3.1 miles. Go, 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 go. So she had to train. She said, Dad, train with me. Let's do this together. A father-daughter event. Yeah, not in this life. I said, Julie, I love you. You want a father-daughter event? Let's meet at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> That's my triathlon, baby. How many can you put down? So to prepare. It was amazing to watch her. She got stronger. She trained for almost a whole year at this. It was a, go it was a goal for her. I know. Why? We raise strange kids. Tammy, I'm sure, has something to do with this. But this was her goal, and it would not deter her. It got in her heart and her mind. She wanted to experience pressing herself and pushing herself and doing the mini triathlon. Her pursuit was not fragile. She was tenacious in her prep. And I remember the day it was a Valpo event, the day she did it. Tammy and I, frankly, were really proud of her accomplishment. And when she ran by... We were with so many other people. We, we, would, we, would, we would see her run by and we would scream, you can do it. You're doing great. Keep going. You can do it. You're going to make it. And we were surrounded by so many other people just yelling encouragement to those runners. And something powerful happened, I noticed. I don't I'll ever forget. They could come around the turn where we all were, kind of dragging. But as we would yell the encouragement, you could see them pick up. The pace picked up. 
as they were surrounded by the voices of, of, of encouragement, remind them, keep going. You saw a physical change in them. Something in, in them was lifted. They, they, they found new energy. Okay, so why tell us? The interesting point here to me, when Jesus describes the Holy Spirit, he uses the term advocate, which comes from a, a, a Greek word, parakalitis, which literally means to come alongside. Jesus is describing this wonderful picture. The Holy Spirit comes alongside to us, yelling, you can do this, empowering us, lifting us. Almost the way people along that triathlon, mini triathlon, were yelling, you can do it. We were playing the role of Pericolatus. We were, we were yelling life into those runners, and you could visibly see the change, encouraging, empowering, reminding them how hard they had trained for the prize of this day. That's the promise of Philippians. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Let's keep going in the Word. My dear friends, you always have obeyed God when I was with you. It is even more important that you obey him while I am away from you. What a statement of following. God is working in us. God is working in us. The Holy Spirit is the paracletus. The Holy Spirit is that advocate. The Holy Spirit is the one saying, go, 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 go. You can. It, 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 it's a marriage. It's our tenacious desire and his power coming together, working out our salvation. This is no longer easy like Sunday morning stuff. If I merely believe I don't need the Holy Spirit, if I merely stand on the sidelines while the runners go by, I don't need them encouraging me. If I merely believe I don't need his help, I don't need his power, I don't need his strength, because I can believe on my own. If I'm going to follow then I need pericolotus. I need that, that Holy Spirit presence. I need that blessing. I need that encouragement. Praise God. It's not just our desire, but it's now married to his power. This desire without power is pointless. You can have all the desire in the world to please God, but without the power to do it, you're just spinning your wheels. Likewise, flip it. You can have all the power we need, but if there's no desire, it's wasted. But combined... Rightfully combined. Our desire married to the Holy Spirit power and we live out kingdom where God receives glory from my life and I am a follower. He supplies my every need. I can defeat Satan every single day. The Holy Spirit stands by the, the side road of our life and continually tells us, run every inch, speaking exactly what we need to hear. Keep going, literally speaking into our lives. Keep going, don't stop, run toward the prize because this real Jesus, not easy like Sunday morning Jesus, is the only prize worth running for. So we choose to follow him over and over and over, daily running, daily experiencing the Holy Spirit, daily cheering us on with his blessings. That's the life I want. And that's what he calls us to. If we merely believe this is almost foreign to us, and if we really merely believe I don't need the Holy Spirit to do that, 